I'm thankful to be in church today. I'm going to tell you one thing I'm thankful for. I'm thankful I'm not up in a tree stand. And it's so cold, the snow and the ice are blowing sideways. And I'm behind the tree, shivering, risking my life, looking down about 20 feet or so, thinking if I fall, I'm going to break like a Coke bottle, waiting for some deer to come out, and I'm shivering so much. Then they finally come out, and I take and draw my bow back, and I'm so cold I can't even draw a bead on the deer. Freezing to death, risking my life. But if I do get a deer, if I figure it out and I'm truthful with myself, I will have gotten some meat in the freezer that only cost me about $780 a pound. <laughs> yeah, man. But next year I'll do better because I'll have a better tree stand and more chemo and a bigger gun. Right? That's the dreams of a hunter. Most seasoned hunters know that just no matter what, <laughs> yeah, it's crazy, isn't it? We have to tell on ourselves. Well, honey, you already have one gun. Why do you need another gun for? Well, I just do. Okay. <laughs> but seasoned hunters will tell you this. No matter how powerful of a gun that you have, or no matter how expensive of a bow that you have, and I've had both, will not do you any good in killing a deer if you hit the tiniest little twig. It will cause that bullet or that arrow to glance and all the power, all the impact, all of the possibilities that was in that bullet or that arrow are now made useless and void. Bing! All the hunters said, amen, right? We know. That's right. <sighs> because an arrow or a bullet, no matter how powerful or how sharp or how great, is rendered useless and has no effect when it's off course. I want to start out by telling you that God intends for your life to have tremendous impact in this world throughout your lifetime at different times. A tremendous impact for him, for his kingdom and his glory. Power, impact, encouragement, whatever it is. But let me tell you this, it won't do you a lick of good or him a lick of good if you're off course. And if you think about it, the bottom line is either living for God or making up your mind that you need to live for God, what is the devil going to try to do? He's going to try to knock you off course. Oh, he doesn't, he's not powerful enough to destroy you. He's not powerful enough to completely trash your life, but he can, through his devices, get you irritated enough, angry enough, bitter enough, hurt enough or whatever that if you don't watch out, he can get you off course too. Now I will tell you this up front. If you know somebody that's been in church a long time and they tell you, well, you see, I got the Holy Ghost 40 years ago or 35 years ago, and, and it's been smooth sailing ever since. I haven't done anything wrong, haven't been messed up, didn't have to go to the altar. I've just been climbing the mountain with no problems. Let me give you a tip. Don't buy a car from them, okay? Because they'll lie to you about other stuff too. Because if you're truthful with yourself, you will have to admit that there have been times that even in your best tries, there's been things that's happened in your life that's knocked you off course for a while, and you knew that you weren't where you needed to be with the Lord. You knew you needed some help. And sometimes you just struggled with that until something happened, some service or something happened, or God came along and helped to get you 
back on track and straighten out. That's what I want to talk about today because I'm going to be truthful with you and tell you that I've been living for God for 42 years. But there's been some times that he's had to get me back on track. Anybody, anybody here today that can relate to that? Maybe there's some people here today that not only can relate to that happening in their lives, but they may feel that that's going on in their life right now. And that's why I want to preach this today is because the Lord laid this on my heart and said, I want to reach for certain people today and I want you to open the door of opportunity for me to work because I want to work in this service. How many people would like for the Lord to work in this service? See, that's when everybody raises their hands. Now if I change the question to this, how many people would like the Lord to work on your heart in this service? Whoa! Now, preacher, don't get down on where I live. Amen? Hey, isn't this what it's all about? This is the filling station. This is where we get encouraged. This is where we hear from the Lord. He speaks to us. He helps us. He touches us. He, he comforts us. He, he educates us. So many things. It's interesting that one definition of the word sin in the Bible, actually, the definition is to miss the mark. To miss the mark. So when the Bible talks about sin in our lives, here's something I want to teach you today. It doesn't mean you're some low-down, underhanded, heinous, vulgar, evil-minded, demon-possessed, dirty individual. It just means you're off the mark. You're off course from what God intends for you to be. But you don't have the power once you realize and look at your own life and realize that you're messed up. You come to the end of yourself. You want to get off that road that you realize, man, I am going the wrong way, Joel. But I don't know how to get off the road. I don't know how the, what the power is. That's why we need God. That's what I want to talk about today. It's just like the arrow or the bullet that it just took a small amount to get it completely off course, to get it completely away from the intended target. Today I want to talk to you about how the devil, with what he did to Adam and Eve, caused mankind to be deflected and be off target from what God intended us to be and the way he intended for us to live with him. Is it okay? You want to go with me there? Want to talk about that? That's great. Well, at least I've got the deer hunter's attention already. Amen. There, there. Oh, yeah, man. <laughs> Whatever. You see, sin in your life actually means that you're not some evil, wicked, horrible person. It means that you are off course as far as God is concerned. And we need to watch out about calling people sinners or putting them in that file because most people are trying as hard as they can to be good and do good. But when you're off course, your goodness has no impact. That's why the Bible says our righteousness is as filthy rags before the Lord. Because no matter how good that we try to be good, spiritual death taints everything we do. So we can't really, every time we try to do good, Daniel, it blows up in our face and turns out bad. Amen? Everybody goes, yeah, I've been there. That's right. And when you're off course, that's just the way your life is. It's just over and over and over again. I used to tell people this a lot when I was a pastor and I'd work with folks. I'd say, listen, when you're lost in the woods, deer hunters, wake up. When you're, I was lost in the woods for four hours one time, thought I'd never see my friends again. But anyway... When you're lost in the woods, I found out this is true. You will come right back to the very same place. I did that two times, lost in the woods, four hours, and walked out probably 550 miles. But I would come right back to the same place. 
And so I use that illustration to tell you this while I'm talking about deer hunting. When you're lost, you know what will happen to you? Because you're off course and you're programmed, you'll come right back to the very same thing. And this is what you'll say. Why does the same thing always have to keep happening to me? You can tell you're lost when you say that. And that's why God started man, mankind out on the right path and the right course, and that's why the devil worked so hard to get mankind knocked off of course and why he worked so hard to keep us knocked off of course because everything we try to do good is going to not have the impact. It's going to be messed up. We're going to get farther and farther away from God, what God intends for us. Order something that's a, you know, some kind of a 9.99 gadget off of, of the whatever, and everybody's buying it, and it's got st stars that are telling you how great it is, and you buy it, and you get it, and it don't do what it's supposed to do. Where is it going to be? It's going to be in your garage sale next summer for $3, and you're going to be hoping some other sucker buys it. But why did you sell it? Because it did not do what it was created to do. Right. What do you think that the Lord thinks when he looks at us and we're not doing what we were created to do? But when you're not doing what you're created to do and you're a human being, that's why you're empty, unfulfilled, right. sad, lonely, and say from time to time, why does the same thing? always have to keep happening to me. Somebody said, amen. I've said that before a number of times. And usually when I said it, I was either punching holes in walls, kicking the cat, burning rubber all the way down the road with wiping tears out of my eyes. Why does the same thing always have to keep happening to me? I'm talking to real people, aren't I, today? Huh? So I think maybe some people can relate. You see, God intended. He had a plan for mankind to live in his presence forever with an intimate relationship, total obedience to him, no pain, no heartache, no suffering. That was the mark that God had intended for mankind when he created mankind, gave him life, and put him in the garden. Like you would take a bow and shoot an arrow at an intended target. But the, Satan, who was the number one worship leader in heaven, got the big head and thought it was more about him than it was about God and decided he was going to become rebellious and, and do things his way. And that caused his intended destiny to be trashed. That's how he learned that if you get out of God's will, you're going to be off track. You're going to be messed up. He couldn't destroy man, so he tricked man into being deflected just a little bit from God's will. That took man to the place where he was out of God's will enough that he could not stay in the presence of God and he had to leave the garden. And from that point on, all of mankind has been out of God's will and every year that passes, mankind gets farther and farther and farther and farther from the intended target that God willed for them. And our world shows that every year. That's why the Bible says, you know, in the last days, people are going to be this way and they're going to be that way. And years ago, people used to go, oh, you're kidding me. Oh, I can't believe it. Whatever. Well, we're there. Hello. We are. We're there. So the devil realized just how far out of God's will that just disobedience could send you. 
because he didn't have the power to kill Adam and Eve, he had the plan to knock them off course, and it worked. Now, every day that they lived, they kept moving farther and farther away. Their descendants now were born farther and farther away, born spiritually dead, physically alive. I was born physically alive, but spiritually dead, much farther off track from where God intended for mankind to be than when Adam and Eve first got kicked out of the garden. Every day, without God, we get farther and farther and farther away. And, and when you're a preacher, here's what you hear some people say. Well, I've been a good person. Well, I'm, I'm a good person. I'm a good person. But yeah, you can be a good person and be trying to be a good person, but if you're off track, tomorrow you're going to be farther off track than you were, and the next day you're going to be farther off track. On and on and on. <laughs> It's just the way that it works. And there's nothing that man could do by himself to get back on course. And that's why God, when he kicked Adam and Eve out of the garden, he said, I have a plan to make everything right again. And he said that it's going to come through the life and the death of a child that's born of a woman. And that's what's going to, through that life and that death, there's going to be a way that's going to be made to get mankind back on the right path again. God said, I got to. And that's why Eve was so excited and why she made the statement, I have gotten a man from the Lord. She thought the little baby that she named Cain was going to be the ticket back in to a right relationship with God that they had lost. Turned out he was a picture of what sin and carnality and distance from God could really do to mankind. And so mankind continued to be off course farther and farther and farther again. So everyone that's born from that time on have just been getting farther and farther away from God. And that includes you and me. I know when I came to God, I was a long way from righteousness. Whew, man. Oh, it's a wonder God didn't fry my hide. Whoa. How many people remember 1968? 1968. Big Macs were 50 cents. That'll bring you right in. Boy, I'll get everybody's attention with that. I was going to college in 1968. I was taking wrestling and doing some other stuff and cutting most every class and playing pool for money and drinking like a fool. And, and uh, every day for just about four, three times a week or four times a week, I'd go to McDonald's and have two Big Macs, two large fries, apple pie, and a strawberry shake. And I could not gain a pound. Now, James, I can't even drive by Walmart without... I couldn't gain a pound because I was young and... Uh, going and running here and doing all that kind of stuff. Life was different in 1968. But in 1968, there were tremendous headlines that were in the, uh, in the paper. Let me get it here. On December the 21st, and it was about the Apollo 8. Man was heading to the moon for the first time. A lot of things were at stake. It was the second manned mission of the American Apollo space program. It was the first human space flight to leave the Earth's orbit and go out where everything had better be right to the nth of a second. There was, uh, it was scary. It was the first to be captured by and escape from the gravitational field of another celestial body and the first crude voyage to return to earth from another celestial body which was the moon apollo 8 took three days to travel to the moon and it orbited 10 times over the course of 20 hours during which the crew made a christmas eve television broadcast in which they read the first 10 verses from the book of genesis you can tell that the world has changed from that. They wouldn't let you do that now. 
So interesting. At that time, and I'd be reading, I'd be wanting to get real spiritual and righteous too if I was been in that rocket up there circling the moon for the first time wondering if I was going to get back home. At the time, no one had ever went to the moon. No one had ever landed on the moon. No one had ever left the Earth's orbit. But there was a problem that came up within the first 11 hours of the flight. NASA realized that the mission was off course by only a fractional amount of degrees. And they had factored in a propulsion thrust burn of 2.4 seconds that successfully put the mission back on track. And the next day in the papers, there was these bold headlines, mid-course adjustment saves the mission, saves the men's lives. All of this stuff about the mid-course adjustment, first time anybody had ever heard those kind of terms when it came to space travel, 1968. Wouldn't it be great if NASA had a plan that could do a mid-course adjustment for people like you and me? When we're way off track, Lee, and we're messed up, and we don't know how to get straightened out, and we just they just radio in what we need to do. Somebody hold up their Bible if you got it with you. You see, that's right there has a mid-course adjustment in it, Keith, for us. All of us here that live on this little blue uh, ball out in space, God factored in a mid-course adjustment for us, Daniel. When our, we're born off track, we're born out of whack, we're messed up, we do all kinds of stuff in our lives that get us further away from God. And when we reach the end of ourselves and we finally realize and admit to ourselves that we're so messed up and that we're going to have to do something that allows God to be able to work in our lives, we're ready for a mid-course adjustment and he's already got it all factored in. He already promised it when he kicked Adam and Eve out of the garden. He said, now you're off course, but I got a plan for a mid-course adjustment for mask mankind. And as soon as a baby's born and lives and dies and teaches and gives himself a sacrifice and builds a bridge between God and man and builds an opportunity for you and me to be able to have a mid-course adjustment in our messed up lives that's going to cause us to end up in a place God never Never intended for us to be. Never intended for you to be or me to be. Aren't you glad God had a mid-course adjustment plan all lined out that works perfectly for you, whether you're in America, Italy, Germany, Thailand? Don't matter. <laughs> it works for everybody. I'm so glad. It worked for heathens like me that walked into the church looking like Charles Manson's stunt double, smoked so much dope I had about an 18-word vocabulary, couldn't stop drinking when I'd start drinking. I was the guy that ended up on the floor. Messed up! I'd only been inside a church building maybe eight or nine, ten times in my whole life when I walked in that apostolic Pentecostal church, and I couldn't even, I couldn't even pronounce the apolastic whatever it was. I just went there. I felt like God wanted me to go there. That's why. I'm so thankful God had a mid-course adjustment plan because I know what it's like to feel dead inside for so long and try to make that feeling go away with the alcohol and dope and possessions and all kinds of other junk. I know what it's like to cry myself to sleep. I know what it's like to come to the end of myself and wonder if putting a bullet in my brain might just fix everything. But I guess I'm just a regular person. And Am I talking to real people today? Do you understand what I'm talking about? How many people are waking up today within five-mile radius of this place that are feeling that very way? That desperately need to know that God has got a mid-course adjustment already planned that works, and it's worked millions and millions and millions of times. It worked for me, it worked for you, and it'll work for anybody. Oh, my goodness. Mm. Hallelujah. God never intended for anybody to be lost. Let me tell you this. God never intended for anybody to be born 
to become the town drunk or to be addicted to drugs. He never intended for anybody to be born to have to live their life with all kinds of hurt and sorrow and loneliness and emptiness. God never intended that for you or me. But because we were born off course, everybody in this fallen world is going to be hurt, and we're all going to deal with that stuff. But the number one thing is, will we get to the point where we admit that we need to, to get that adjusted and get on the right track? God never intended. Can't you just see somebody, the teacher says, what do you want to be whenever you grow up? Third grade teacher, oh, I want to be a demoniac. I'd like to be the town drunk. You look at baby pictures, they're so cute, they're so sweet, they're so innocent. How in the world did they turn out to be robbers and thieves and prostitutes and, and killers and all that? I'll tell you why, because we're off course and we need God desperately need God and the devil doesn't want you to know that there is a mid-course adjustment that can happen in your life he wants you to never believe that it could happen to you Jesus gave the instructions to Peter he said repent be baptized in Jesus name for the remission of sin and you shall receive the gift of the Holy Ghost then Peter said you need to save yourselves from this warped and perverted generation. Jesus came and set everything up, and then he said, I'm going to give you the keys to the kingdom. You're going to open up the opportunity for mankind to get a mid-course adjustment and get them back in right relationship with me. I'm so glad that God worked all of that out because there was no way any of us could have done it. You can't be good enough. You have to become, you see, for you to be able to make heaven, you have to become a supernatural individual. And the only way that you can become, go from carnal to supernatural is you must have a supernatural experience. Nicodemus came to Jesus at night, and Nicodemus comes, and he starts asking Jesus questions, and I just can't help but think that Jesus probably looked at him and said, look, Nicodemus, you're a scholar and you're a bleeder and you're a wise guy. Let me just put it this way. Do you want an explanation or do you want an experience? Because you're wanting an explanation, but I'm offering an experience. And if we can just help people that are lost understand, well, I can't, understand, I can't explain everything to you. But when you have the experience, then you'll understand. That's the awesome thing about the Holy Ghost. You can't explain it to people. Whenever I got it, I felt like 440 volts just hit me at the top of my head and went out and blew my socks off. I stood straight up, and I couldn't do anything but take off running around the church and jumping up. I was higher than I'd ever been. I was drunker than I'd ever been. I was happier than I'd ever been. But it doesn't happen that way for everybody. It's different. But it's a supernatural experience. And if we're going to live with a supernatural God, we have to go through an experience that helps us to be supernatural people. You see, when you're living a carnal life, you're off course. You were never intended to live your life in carnality because you'll always be an enemy of God until you become supernatural, and that's the way. It's an experience intended for you and for me. It's a wonderful thing to know that God has intended for us a mid-course adjustment that's waiting for anybody that will come and ask him to receive that. I will tell you this, there are a lot of deer that are not going to end up in the freezer this year. And the reason is, oh, you'll hear the, dinner, the deer hunters tell you, man, I had him good to rights, and there was this little tiny limb that I didn't see, and my bullet hit that, and it blew him. And, or I thought, oh, man, he was a 10-point monster, and I had him dead to rights, and my arrow just barely hit that, and then he was gone. 
Then you get some Kleenexes and you sit there and cry. Amen. There's a lot of deer that's gonna, never going to end up in the freezer because the bullet or the arrow missed the mark. Now, can I tell you this? There's a lot of good folks that are never going to make heaven because they're going to miss the mark. They're not evil. They're not wicked. They are not intentionally trying to be evil or wicked. They're just off course and they don't realize it. And they need somebody in their life to help them realize that God has worked things out and made a way for them to have a mid-course adjustment in their life, no matter if they're 93 years old or nine years, or whatever. Amen, that's our job. But the pull of the world is too much for too many people, and they continually refuse the offer that God has for them to realign their lives and get on the right course. Amen. That's what the Bible talks about, walking in the light as he is in the light. You see, if you turn the lights off in somebody's life and they're blind, it's going to be very easy for them to make a lot of wrong choices and go in the wrong direction. But the Lord wants to get us on the right path. Aren't you glad that God put you on the right path? I'm so glad that God came into my life and he loved me enough because he didn't have to. Man, I was so messed up, Joel. It still shocks me that God stopped along the way and reached down and started dealing with my heart, turned on the light and helped me to realize the path that I was on and where it was taking me. He didn't have to do that. Several years ago, there was a read, I read about this young girl. She was either 10 or 11, I can't remember. But every year, <clears throat> for years and years, in Wheatland, North Dakota, because it's big, flat land, and they do giant farms out there with tractors that are half as big as this <clears throat> room right here with tires that are like, whoa, and plows that are, whoa, whoa and uh, big time stuff. And uh, so they have this plowing competition and all these old timers and these old farmers, they all enter and then the, they plow for a long, long, long distance and then these judges, they side in and they uh, use their whatever instruments and they side in and check and then they give uh, the award to the person that plowed the straightest furrow and this 10 or 11-year-old girl won it several years ago. And when they were, um, when they were uh, interviewing her, they were like, everybody was shocked. Man, these old-timers that had been winning and plowing and farming since long before she was ever even born, she beat them. And so they interviewed her, and they said, girl, how in the world did you plow such a straight row and beat these other guys and these old-timers? She said, well, she said, my grandpa taught me to plow, and here's what he told me. When you let that clutch out, you get started, you get your eye on one thing, and don't you ever take your eye off of it, and you let that be the one thing that you head for, and don't you... <laughs> Think about anything else. Can I tell you today that it might do us a lot of good that now we've started living for God if we get our eyes on Jesus and not let anything get us off of that. Well, what about what they said? Keep on plowing. Well, what about what they did? Well, get your eyes on the Lord and don't let the devil get you off track. Don't let what somebody did to you, what somebody said to you, or what you had to go through, don't let it get you off track. Because when you're off track, you lose the impact. You lose power. You lose anointing. You lose your influence. Is this okay? And that old guy, he really is losing it, isn't he? Whoa. Huh? It's important. There's tremendous power in being in the will of God. And that's why the devil hates it, Sam. He will do anything and use anybody to get you the slightest little bit. And too many times he'll give us the excuse, well, yeah, you know, I... I know about church, and, and I, you know, I'm, I know this and that and stuff. But, but, you know, I'm pretty good. I'm not too bad. I'm not too far off. 
Well, you might only be two degrees off today, but where, how far off are you going to be in 30 days or a month or six months? Where are you going to be when the trumpet sounds? That's what I'm wondering. Amen. That's a pretty important thing to think about. Oh, my goodness. I'm going to land the plane here in a minute. You see, I realized that I was born off course. And even when life seemed good, I was still on my way to hell. I was still not going to end up where God had intended for Bill Jones to end up. Because you see, God created you with the intent for you to live with him for eternity in the place that he inhabits. But the devil does not want you to make that. This wonderful plan that God has allows us, no matter what our age, no matter what's happened to us, no matter what we've been through, no matter what is done, God has made this plan to where it has the power to get us on course and get us in his will and get us headed in the right direction. Can I say that when we do get on track, we got to get our eyes on Jesus and keep him there all the way to the end. And it would be very good for us to ask ourselves every once in a while, what do I have my eyes on? Am I too focused on what somebody said to me or am I too focused on what somebody did to me? Am I letting the devil sit on my shoulder and whisper that stuff in my ear? You know, every once in a while, and I've been around long church, and I've pastored for 35 years. Every once in a while, I hear somebody, and, and they would say years ago, and you still hear it every once in a while, oh, I tell you what we really need is, we really need a, the voice of a prophet to really you know, speak in our church. But you know what? When I pray about that and think about that, you know what the Lord tells me? You may not want a prophet to speak to you, darling, because he might tell you that you need to get over it and get with it. He might tell you, you've got a rotten spirit and you're still letting the devil mess you up because you're angry or mad or you haven't forgiven somebody. Yeah, right. Yeah, that's how prophets talk to people. And they, well, yeah, come here and let me just hold you and we'll sing come by y'all. Yeah. No prophet's going to do that to you, sweetheart. Nah, not in today's time. You know, we might think we want a prophet, but we might not like it if he speaks to us the truth. Amen? <laughs> Am I right, Sam, or not? Okay, Sam says I'm right, so you know that's good. Uh -huh. So here's the question I want to land the plane with. Or I want to, I want to say this first, and then I'm going to ask the question. This month, I celebrated an anniversary 42 years ago on November the 9th, 1980, I came to the altar the very first time because I did not want to live one more day like I had been living. I had come to the end of myself. I was done. It was either give God a try or put a bullet in my head or whatever. I was done. And I was so thankful to God that he didn't say, here, fill out these forms and triplicate or get your life together before I consider helping you out. He just took me in. He had a plan that worked for me, even though I didn't understand it, Sister Corn. It worked for me. You don't have to figure it out. You just got to give him permission to work in your life. Amen? I wanted off the road that I was on, but I didn't know how to get off it. I didn't want to live one day anymore the old life. I'd come to the end of myself, and I realized I needed a major adjustment. And that's exactly what God had for me. And that's exactly what God has for each of us. Could I ask you a question today? Sure, you got the Holy Ghost. Sure, you're in church. Sure, you've been baptized in Jesus' name. But are you on track or are you like a lot of folks that may be a little off track and heading in a place maybe you're struggling with? Have you 
gotten to the place where you never intended for your heart or your spirit to be? Do you need a mid-course adjustment? I'm not talking about people that are lost. Sure, there are people here that really need to talk to God about this stuff. But this is church people too. And I will be honest with you and tell you, I was a pastor for 35 years, but there were times that God had to come in and give me a mid-course adjustment because I got a bad spirit. I got angry. I was, I was thinking the wrong things. I was, I was, I, uh, I want to rip people's heads off in Jesus' name. You know what I'm talking about? And then God had to come along, just like the, what I told, shared with you earlier. God had to come along and remind me my, my life did not belong to me. It wasn't for me to get angry and upset and complain about. It belonged to him. It was for me to trust him with my life. So today, not only am I asking if there's people in here that feel like they're a million miles away from God, I'm asking maybe you have had some things working on you, digging into your heart, messing up your your uh, peace or your working on your spirit because God is just as powerful and he knows what he's doing. He's had to give me some mid-course adjustments. And if anybody tells you they've been in church for a long time and they haven't had God do that, then they're, they're missing something somewhere. Now I'm going to share this with you. When these headlines came in and they began to talk about this mid-course adjustment, NASA revealed that they actually had several other mid-course adjustments planned ahead of time and lined out. And I said that to say this, when you got the Holy Ghost, that wasn't the only time God intended to give you a mid-course adjustment. He knew you were going to get messed up. He knew people were going to hurt you. He knew things were going to happen and break your heart. He knew you were going to get messed up. He knew that you might get off course and some of you worse than others. God already knew that. And I'm telling you, he already has some mid-course adjustments factored in today. And that's why he gave me this sermon because he told me that there would be some people, they they're not horrible, they're not evil, they're not out, whatever, but it's been bugging them that they know that they're not in that place that they really want to be with the Lord. And the Lord said, if you'll preach this message and give people opportunity, there'll be some people that'll respond to it today. So that's what I'm talking about. Is today the day that you realized or you would admit to yourself, hey, I've gotten off course my life has not been exactly what it needs to be. I've let too many things distract me. I'm, 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 I, need to, I need to, maybe somebody might have came in today and just said, God, I just want to know you love me one more time. Maybe somebody's just been down and out and feeling like God has left them and hung them out to dry, and today he wants to wrap his arms of love around you and let you know, I just need to love you back into this, this little spot right here. No, I'm not saying you're a million miles off. I'm just saying every once in a while. I remember when my grandson was learning to walk, and I would walk behind him and let him walk, and he'd come to a screen door and hit it, and it'd fly out and then come back, and it would have knocked him down or put a big bruise in him. I'd stick my arm out and catch it. He'd just keep blowing right on through and never even know it. It could have knocked him down. You know, you move things out of the way, or then all of a sudden they're going to do this and fall off of somewhere, and you just put your hand right there like that. Maybe the Lord wants to do that for some people here today, just a little touch. Maybe you just need a little touch, but I'm telling you, the Lord wants to touch you today. Let's all stand. Let's all stand. Thanks so much for being here with us today. One thing we truly value at Calvary is community. And whether today is your first time joining us or Calvary has been your church for years, we truly want to connect with you. Make sure to stay connected with us throughout the week online at springfieldcalvary.church and on Facebook. We believe God has something unique to say to you, and our hope is that you feel His love stronger today than ever before. Thanks again for being with us, and have a wonderful day, a wonderful week in the Lord.